I'm a professor at the Hebrew University. Um, been working on machine learning essentially even before it started to be called machine learning. And so we, and we really, uh, really proud to see not less than four of my PhD students among the speakers here today. So, um, and I will be talking today about um, some theory of deep learning, um, which is something we really miss and, and need. So, I assume here that all of you know what deep learning is, but just uh, one slide of history. So, you know that uh, deep neural network uh, started more or less in the 40s but with the idea of the perceptron or the, what we call the mccullough pitts neuron, which is essentially this idea of a dot product of weights by an input with some nonlinearity like a sign. And since then, it, ha it was introduced, actually it was suggested in the work of Frank Rosenblatt during the 50s and 60s uh, as what he called the perceptron, which is essentially already the idea of a multi-layer network, but he really didn't know how to train the, the, the lower layers of the network. Uh, he had a very nice algorithm. He inv invented what we call the perceptron algorithm, but it was a way of only training the, the higher last layer of the network. And then it, it was essentially bashed or killed by these two clever people, Minsky and Papert, in their famous book called Perceptron, which I still highly recommend. It's a classical example of a perfectly rigorous work, which is completely wrong. <laughs> Uh, I mean, full of interesting theorems, a lot of insight, but the basic thesis that they were trying to prove that perceptions cannot work and cannot be used for pattern recognition was, of course, completely wrong. Still very interesting book. Neural networks came back into the game, what we call the first connectionism uh, era in the 80s with the work of the PDP, the Rumelard Hinton and others, in, the early 80s, 82, 83, 84, this is actually when I started to get interested in that. And uh, th so there was a nice wave of neural networks, which we call now shallow networks with only a few hidden layers during the 80s and 90s, and then came uh, Vapnik, essentially in the late 90s, in the late 80s, and uh, changed it into something which was called then support vector machines, kernel machines, and other things like this, which for about 10 years really took over the machine learning community. It was essentially some kind of a neural network, was very simple and very rigorous. I mean, you could actually prove results about it much nicer than we could on, on, deep, on, neural, on the original neural networks. But uh, due to the stubbornness of some people like Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun and a few others, a good friend of mine, uh, eventually in the late 2000, around 2008-9, neural network came back in a slightly different version, which is what we now call deep, with many, many layers. I mean, many, many more than the three or four or five that uh, we used in the earlier versions. We now use the uh, deep learning with uh, tens or even hundreds of layers. And uh, miraculously, with not, without too much understanding, those things started to beat the market, essentially all the pattern recognition, classical pattern recognition and eye problems from vision to speech to, to, to natural language processing to many other things were dramatically improved by the application of what we now call deep learning. And this is, of course, a very uh, challenging and sad news for theoreticians because we really didn't understand what's going on there. So for me, as at least partly theoretician in this area, uh, this was a challenge and luckily, uh, so we desperately needed a theory, and we needed something, many versions of the theory, we needed optimality bounds in the sense of how many examples are needed to achieve a certain precision or a certain generalization error, uh, what actually characterized the capacity, I mean, what is the, the kind of problems that can be learned or can be fit even to the data with deep neural networks, what are the design principles, I mean, how to design a network for a certain task, how to interpret the network. Of course, we want better learning algorithms because what we do now is essentially something that seems rather stupid, a stochastic gradient descent. There must be something better than this. At least that's what we all thought. Okay, so I want to introduce a, 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 a path or a line of work that I've been doing for many, many years. Actually, it came back, became much more powerful recently because of 
the success and popularity of deep learning, which is the connection between information theory and neural networks. So when I say information theory, most machine learning people really don't see the connection. I mean, uh, information theory is about communication and compression and things like this. What does it have to do with machine learning or with deep learning in particular? So this is something which I've been pursuing with a lot of good people for over many, many years. And essentially what I want you to see now is, is this picture that essentially the deep neural network we call the input X. So the X is all the layer, all the input layer of the network, which is a huge variable. Think about pixels of an image or something. It's, it's a multivariate, highly complex statistical variable over the class of things that we, let's say, we're trying to classify pictures or images. There are huge of them. We don't really know the distribution of these things, but we know it's complex. And then why is, is the label can be one bit. I mean, like, there is a face in the image or something like this, or it is a cat or a, a dog or something like this. So Y is usually a lot simpler than X. And uh, what we get is some, what we call data is a sample from the joint distribution of these two variables. Although, of course, we usually we don't have the joint distribution, but we can sample it, and that's what we, we all do. And then, of course, what the neural network is doing is taking this variable x and, and move it through a cascade of hidden layers, which I call here h1, h2, and so on, and that I call them t1 or t, which are essentially a re-representation of the input. So this is what we call internal representation. Essentially, we change the shape of the, in the, of the input, and eventually, miraculously, after many, many transformations like this, which form actually a Markov chain of representation, so each one depends only on the previous one, Eventually, we, we have this last layer from which we can very simply, with a linear perceptron or a linear classifier, can find the label. So that's the deep learning network for, for the purpose of what I'm talking about. I really want to understand what's actually happened in those internal representations. This is one of the key questions. Then I want to understand also what is the benefit of the hidden layers, how to design networks better, and how to improve the algorithm, all those questions. So, I don't have time for much theory, I just want to, but I need it. So I just want you to all understand two, two concepts. One of them is what we call the cross entropy or the KL divergence of two distributions, which is defined like this. If this is the first time you see it, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to explain it anymore. anymore. It's just a positive, non-negative quantity, which is zero only if these two distributions are the same. And it's a very fundamental measure in information theory for many, many reasons. One of them is it's defined something we call the mutual information. And the mutual information between two variables is just the, the scale divergence between the joint distribution and the product of the marginals. So essentially, it tells us how independent those variables are. It is zero if the x and y are independent. And it's greater than zero otherwise. And you can think about it also as how much information there is in x about the label in terms of bits. Or if you want, in, in a more picturesque term, how many binary questions I can ask, ask about X? What is the minimal number on average of binary yes-no questions I can ask about X in order to find Y? The, the, or everything that X has about Y. And this quantity is really fundamental for reasons I'll explain in a minute, but there are two things I really want to remember, you to remember about it. The first one is it, it is invariant under reparameterization. If I do any perm permutation of X, change it completely, the mutual information is not going to change, as long as it is, in, it is an invertible transformation. And the other thing is what we call the data processing inequality. So information, if you have a Markov chain, like in the layers of the network, the information within X and Z cannot be larger than information within X and Y. OK, so using this, I can already start thinking about the layers in terms of information. So essentially what I want to do is to think about each one of those hidden layers as one random variable. All the layer together, not one neuron, all of them, and think how much information it's maintained on the input and how much information actually provides on the output. And in, in these two numbers, which I actually argue are the only really important numbers to remember about deep learning when you talk about very large problems, and I try to prove it to you, uh, then we know due to this data pro processing inequality that if I look at the information between X and the layers, H1, H2, and so on, I have a cascade of inequalities like this. And the same about the Y, the information that the layers preserved by the label can only decrease when I go through the network. So this is actually defining something which I call the information pass. And actually, another way of thinking about it, each of those hidden layers is actually encoding through some sort of an encoder. So here the layer is T. So this Ti, let's say, 
has an encoder, which is the map from the input, and a decoder, which is the map from T to the output. And what I really argue, that the only thing that you really should care about, which is the only thing that matters in terms of how much data you need in order to train the network, and how precise or how accurate your network is going to be, are the, the mutual information of the encoder and the mutual information of the decoder. So these are what I call the information plan quantities. These two coordinates are the only thing I really want to under, to, you to, to look at. And that answer, the question I want to answer now is what actually happens during the training of a deep neural network in this information plan. So I'm going to show you a lot of pictures like this. This is the information about the label. This is the information about the input. And the different spheres here are layers of hidden of deep neural networks in that, that case, 50 of them trained the same architecture exactly trained on one problem. So I want you to see the movie, the movie of how these things look. So, oh, sorry. This was a. So, essentially, what you see here is the dynamics of the training as a function of the epochs of backpropagation, I mean, cycling through the data. And you see something quite interesting. I mean, they all come up very quickly. And then they do something unexpected. They move to the left. Moving to the left means they compress the representation. They actually forget information about the input. And you see that most of the epochs, the 20 something, 40,000 epochs here, eventually, so they did something which I can summarize in one picture, very quickly improve the information about the label, and then very slowly compress the representation or forgot and forget information about the input. So this, this is some, something so, somewhat surprising to people who never saw this before. So essentially, I want to, so let me just give you one picture what actually happens here. So essentially, what you see here is in one image, the full path. I mean, so this is how we started the network. And then when I increase the epochs, they climb up to this point. I'll tell you something about this point later on. And then eventually move to the left. All the layers, each layer move to the left and compress the input. And this is, by the way, what happens if you train with a lot of data. This is some intermediate, 40% of data, and this is only 5% of the data. And you see that when you first train, you get this e empirical risk minimization, which everybody is doing. Essentially, I, I first compress, I first fit the data, and even actually increase a little bit my information about the input. And then I compress the representation. And if I, have, I don't have enough data, this compression is actually decreasing my information about the label. If I have enough data, it stays up. So what's going on here? So first of all, this is some sort of x-ray of the network. I mean, this is a, a very nice way to see what's going on inside, what each layer is doing, and how it changed during the representation. Even this representation alone is already interesting, but I want to I want to get back to theory. I'm sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. So I want to, to go back to theory. And I apologize for those who haven't seen this before. So all of learning theory is based on, on this type of bounds, which we call the generalization bound, which is essentially the error, or the square of the error is bounded by the log of what we call the hypothesis class size. How many samples are there? How many machines are there of this, of this class? plus divided by the number of some examples, with some correction which depends on the confidence, which I don't care about. This is the classical learning theory. This is what you hear in every textbook. So epsilon is generalization error, delta is the confidence, m is the number of examples, and h epsilon is an epsilon cover of the hypothesis class. Those who don't know what I'm talking about, this is more or less the first. Usually we assume that this h epsilon is, has some behavior like 1 over epsilon to some dimension, where this is like the VC dimension of the class, or something like this. OK. The problem is that these bounds don't work for deep learning. They don't give us anything useful. Because usually, the estimate of the VC dimension of a deep neural network is way high, higher than what we see in practice. This, we all know. I mean, we actually have more parameters, orders of magnitudes more parameters than examples, and we don't overfit. So this theory is wrong fundamentally. So I want to suggest an alternative. And the alternative is that essentially, instead of compressing, instead of fitting an hypothesis class, we actually compress the input. So think about the input as, as divided into spheres, and what I call epsilon spheres. So the probability of two points in the input to have different labels in the same sphere is smaller than epsilon. So 
essentially we know that the number of possible functions is exponential in the, in the size of this cover. If this cover is all of x, so 2 to the x is all the possible functions, it's not very useful. If I manage to compress the input a little bit, then I can compress uh, the, the, my compression class significantly because there is an exponential here. So if, now information theory is telling me that the size of this cover is essentially exponential in the mutual information between the layer and the input. This is exactly the same argument that you see in ray distortion theory or in channel coding. I don't have time to prove, to prove it now. But if you believe this, then I get this type of bounds. This type of bounds is that the error is actually bounded by the exponent of the compression, not the exponential, actually how much I, I manage to compress without losing the error, plus the other things. Which means that if I can compress the representation by k bits, it's essentially equivalent to multiplying the data by 2 to the k. So this is amazing. Compression is a lot more powerful than reducing the dimensionality of the hypothesis class. Essentially, I argue that the hypothesis class is an, is an old notion. We don't really need it. We can't really use it for the concept of deep learning. So let me try to understand what's going on now in terms of these measures. Five minutes. OK. It's going to be challenging. So essentially, what you see is that most of the training, most of the cycles of the of the, of the network, of the, of the training, the network, is actually spent on compression, reducing the, the mutual information that the layer has about the input from, let's say, 9 bits here, this is the second hidden layer, to 3 bits here. So this compression is essentially, as I just said, is just like multiply, multiplying the data by 2 to the 6. It's a huge improvement in generalization. OK, so I said, that's very nice. So essentially, all we want is to compress the input. So why do we need so many layers? So let me try to answer that. And then, I, then I'll tell you how it actually happens. So by the way, the picture that you saw now was given, was done by Ravid Ziv, who is sitting here somewhere, on a very small problem. But then, of course, people ask, do you see it also for large problems? So the answer is yes, we do. This is actually the MNIST data, MNIST uh, digital recognition, handwritten digital recognition, classical uh, uh, toy example for deep learning. And you see exactly the same picture. The layers, this is actually trained with ReLUs and not uh, sigmoids, and trained with uh, Adam and all sorts of tricks for, 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 for improving the generalization. And you see the, exactly the same picture. The layers first move up and then slowly move to the left, compress the representation. So this seems like a general phenomenon. We also see it in many other problems. So how can it, and it explain the number, the benefit of the deep, the layers? Okay, that's really one of the key problems. So here you see, again, the work of Ravid. A lot, uh, the same problem trained with one hidden layer, two hidden layers, three hidden layers, and so on, up to six hidden layers. The same problems on the same data. And what is really striking is that with one hidden layer, it takes forever. Essentially, after 10 to the fourth epochs, I hardly get anywhere. As with six hidden layers on the same data, I converge essentially here to very good representations. So the number, the hidden layers actually boost my performance. They essentially enhance the number, they cut the number of training epochs by something which looks like an exponential factor in the number of hidden layers. So we have a theory for this. I don't have time to tell it to you, because I, I really want to just show you, I'm sorry. I, wa I want to show you one thing, and this is why it happens. So essentially, this is a key figure, and I'll finish with this. What you see here is the gradient of the stochastic gradient descent. The solid line are the mean magnitude of the gradient, L2, L2 norm, and the broken line are the standard deviation of the gradients, and the standard deviation is across the, the, what we call the different batches of the training. So we actually don't train on all the examples together, we train on mini batches, and those mini batches introduce stochasticity in the gradient. And what you see here is quite striking. So this is a log-log scale, this is the number of epochs in a log scale, and uh, this mean and, and standard deviation in log scale. And you see that we start at the beginning with very high mean, and very low variance, which means that the signal to noise of the gradient is very high. But then at some point, which actually is exactly the need, this, this uh, beginning of compression in my information plan variables, you see that the mean grows down and the variance goes up. 
becomes much higher. This is what we call a low signal to noise regime. I mean, the, so the gradient becomes very noisy. When the gradient is noisy, essentially I'm pushing noise into the weights. I'm pushing noise into the weight. Essentially, the, the gradient is doing very little here. It's just keeping the error small, the training error small. And the rest is just adding noise to the weights. And what I'm arguing, I, I don't have time to really explain it, but this noise is the miracle of deep learning. This noise is essentially wiping out the irrelevant information in the data and essentially compress the representation because I'm losing information about the input without losing information about the label. And this compression, as we saw before, is giving me this exponential boost in generalization. Now, this is a slow process. This happens something through something we call diffusion. I mean, a random walk, a random walk in these weights. Essentially, I'm adding noise to the weights. And diffusion takes exponential time to compress. So compressing in one layer is exponential in the whole number of bits. If I compress this with piecewise pieces, for only from the previous layer at each time, I get an exponent, instead of exponent of the sum of all the compression, the sum of the exponents, and this is the reason for the boost of the deep learning. Okay, I know this was a lot of theoretical material for one short talk, but that's the main message, so we begin to understand what's going on, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much.